Welcome to Beyond Distribution with GTDC Podcast. In this episode, Dave O'Callaghan, Managing Partner of Vation Ventures, leads a best practices discussion on ramping up sales and adoption of AI technologies. Recorded live from the GTDC Summit North America in Oceanside, California, the discussion highlights the many benefits and challenges of these solutions and how distribution is empowering their sales and adoption. The guest panelists include Mike Aerosmith, Chief Trust Officer for Ninja One, Dan Campbell, former president of Aero ECS, and Darren Williams, CEO and founder of Black Fog. Access more podcast episodes and other resources created specifically for channel vendors and distributors on the GTDC Knowledge Hub. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, and uh, my guests, if you want to join me, I will do a quick preamble uh, for you. Yes, I am elderly, officially. Um, so thank you, Frank, for reminding me of that, which is why I have notes, because I don't remember anything anymore. So um, while my guests are coming up for the panel, um, Vation Ventures, we provide innovators a path to success. What does that mean? Well, you're all actually innovators. So we work with the VCs and the private equity companies, the money guys. They give some of these folks a lot of money. And then the distribution network, which is a lot of you all, need to address the needs of the emerging techs so that they can get their money back and pay the VC back their money and exit with an IPO. It's a beautiful thing. The other innovators that are not in the room today, the resellers and the end customers. My company has 1,500 CIOs in its network and we're constantly gathering research that validates a lot of actually what IDC has to say in a little bit. So it's a pleasure to be here. I think I've been here for about 20 of these. Actually, when I took over distribution at Cisco Systems, Mr. Chambers said, uh, you know, Dave, if you, could, if you could do distribution for me, I'd sure appreciate it. You know where I'm going with that? And I, I said, no, I have no idea what you're going with. That. I don't know how to spell distribution. I was a sales guy. <laughs> and he said, you'll learn, you'll learn. And I said, it's global? And he said, yes, yes. And I said, it's, I, I don't even have a passport. He said, go get one, they'll like you, you'll do fine. And so the first thing I did, and what I hope you'll take away from this, was at the time, Bob Dukowski was the CEO of Tech Data, which is now TD Cinex. He told me, Dave, learn ROIC. We talked about it in the CFO room yesterday. Why learn ROIC? See, at Cisco, we had 42 days that our DVARs would pay us. 42 days. Bob said, why don't you give us 35 days? 40 days, not 30 days. I will pay you on the moment it's due. And you'll pick up two days and the distributor will win. So for all the vendors in the room, go find out if you have a direct VAR, what their average pay cycle is. That's my best advice from Bob Dukowski all the way to today. The next guy was Roy Valley at one of these meetings. <laughs> Roy was the head of AdMet. He said, you guys are getting into the server, you're gonna need us. He was right. We did, and AbNet did a great job for us, and Arrow as well. So in this room, you have the ability to make these relationships in just two days' time that will, these pearls of wisdom, you can have for a lifetime. So enough about me and all that stuff. I wanna introduce you to my friends. Right here, this is Mike, <laughs> and you, you guys know Dan Thank and Darren. So um, two of the three of them are with emerging technology companies. Usually you can pick them out by the shoes that they wear because they typically don't wear the Adidas, the shooter's <laughs> shoes over there, right? He's actually the distributor. <laughs> so so I, I wanted Your to introduce, introduce my friends from the emerging tech world first. Um, Darren Williams is the CEO of a company called Black Fog. In a world of AI, AI and security go hand in hand. I'm a board member on two companies and every board meeting, board members are held personally responsible for the security of the, of the firm. Board members are now asking, you know, do we have AI and is it secure? Black Fog does that. Darren, why don't you tell us, and he also is a pharmacologist, so if anybody needs a little something later on. <laughs> That's a long story. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Black Fog was founded in 2015. Uh, we really um, looked at the market, and actually I used my background from pharmacology 
to look at the problem of cybersecurity in a different way. Uh, traditionally, we're all used to seeing defensive-based approaches. We've got endpoint detection response systems, XDRs, and, and so forth. And we thought, well, that's great. There's great products in that category. Don't try and compete with that. But what is it all about? And we thought, well, it's actually all about the data, and it's about data security. And if we look at the ransomware trends that are happening around the world right now, 91% of all ransomware attacks around the world now actually involve data exfiltration. And why is that important? Because once they have your data, they've got something to extort you with. And so we invented a category called anti-data exfiltration, and so we use AI to really stop that data flow outside of a corporation, even off your device specifically, especially in these day and age when we're all in hybrid workforce sort of scenarios, no one's behind a corporate firewall, so you know the old DLP type solutions really aren't adequate to really to work with that. So really that's why we started uh, Blackbox. So we're basically, we've been through our Series A round, um, that we're growing at about 400% a year. And why are we here today? We're here to maybe um, ask a little bit about what does it take to get into the distribution network? I, I actually um, was speaking to Mike yesterday and he's like our big brother. He's like two years ahead of where we are and we're struggling to understand that we know the value chain, but we find it very difficult at our stage of growth to get into that. So I guess that's what we're gonna be talking a little bit about, my struggles and what I want to do and how we want to grow the company. So thank you. I'll be Dave. back at you, thank you. Um, yeah, exfiltration is you, my company does those AI assessments for our 1500 CIOs in our network. And with the advent of chat GPT, GPT the, the, the amount of usage of that particular type of product is exfiltrating a lot of IP out of your companies. Right. And so having the ability to, to do exfiltration security is key. My friend Mike is here on behalf of, of Sal, his CEO, who's at his sales kickoff in Vegas. So hopefully he's feeling okay this morning. <laughs> um, Sal has, uh, Sfera has uh, started five companies, four of which the first four he took public. This one, Ninja One, is a true unicorn by any measure, by any measure. And Mike Aerosmith is the head of, uh, he's the CTO chief trust officer, so he's actually an internal user. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and uh, Ninja One? Uh, absolutely, Th thank you guys so much for having me here today. I'm really excited. Uh, I think truly a part of our success in our future is probably in this room. Um, when we think about Ninja One, we build products today to enable IT organizations to be able to manage their endpoints. We offer a full suite of products and solutions around this desktop uh, user experience and really where I get asked the most questions is, what does a chief trust officer mean and do? Um, probably the most simplistic means to explain it is I'm a cybersecurity focused CIO. Today I'm responsible for all of IT, all of cybersecurity and our platform that we deliver our products to our customers. I am the technology buyer persona for many in this room. I manage a multi-million dollar budget for all of the various solutions from all the various different business par uh, departments and I think like every CIO that you interact with, I'm bound by three core principles. How do we continue to enable scale? How do we continue to innovate? And how do we do so at the uh, most capital efficiency way possible? The, the, the nuance, and I think what drew me to, to Ninja was this chief trust role. Um, when we think about the nuance difference of that, in, in the products world, we're really fixated on generating products that do something cool, do something sexy. We hear lots about AI, we hear lots about security. A lot of what is missing in, in the products world is what do we do with all of the data that we collect from those particular products that we build? And that for me is probably one of the most fascinating pieces about my role. My role is really to ensure our customers, yours and mine, have full carte blanche trust in the products that we build are built with the mindset that they are as secure as possible, that we are not going to do silly things with their data like try to repackage it and sell. Um, we, we try to protect every bit of data that we get that it is, if it's our own. So this is the unique part about my role that I take really uh, uh, wholeheartedly, that we are building the most secure products possible we are doing the right things on behalf of our customers and we continue to ensure 
the trust continues on as we develop and innovate various solutions. Um, and just to kind of dovetail, you know, where we are in, in our company growth, as Dave kind of uh, eloquently put, we've been founded since 2014. Uh, we've been in this business now for almost 10 years. We just recently closed our Series C round of funding. Just earlier this week, we made the world uh, known. Um, we're doing 70% year-over-year growth. We have over 12,000 endpoints under management, uh, and we have tremendous, tremendous upside. Uh, so really excited to be here with all of you, and hopefully our paths cross on, on how we can enable one another to continue our scale and growth. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, they, they are amazing. For the channel people in the room, uh, the deal reg to close is less than 90 days for the patch management beginning of the platform. It's, it's truly amazing from what I've seen in the industry over a long period of time. Now our last guest is here. Dan's going to try to control himself because he's president of Aero ECS, but he's representing all distributors up here. So Michael, if he says something that, that <laughs> you're not, you let him know. Uh, but uh, Dan, Dan, many of you probably knew during his EMC and Dell EMC days. So uh, Dan, welcome. And, and what have you been learning over the last year? Yeah, thanks, Dave. So first of all, it's really good to see a CIO that can sell. I'll take you out on a sales <laughs> call. <here. laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I am the neophyte in the room relative to distribution. So, um, you know, I think uh, I think my counterparts forgot more at breakfast this morning about distribution than than I know from the distribution side. But growing up in it from a, uh, from a supplier side, I was a customer of distribution, and I was thinking about it in advance of today relative to how the, how the uh, industry has changed. Well, did you start your career? 83, 1983, <laughs> not 1883. I know where you're going with that, all right? All right, so uh, I started mine in 1986. Okay, Anybody know it. what the predominant server was, or a, a server device was in 1986? It's called an IBM main, mainframe. Yeah. Oh, wow. and then. And then they had these things called mini computers. There were these little upstarts, Wang and Data General. All storage was attached to either uh, to the server. It was all server attached to the mainframe or the mini device. Um, there was no cloud. Uh, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. Um, <laughs> so if you think about that relative to, the, I, I think about the waves of computing that we've been through in our careers to where we are now yeah. um, in, in 2014, I had lunch with uh, Symantec John Thompson and said, I'm, I'm really curious about the security market. There are five big players and there are, seems like a, a hundred players that are less than 50 million in rev. Okay, so fast forward to now, that was 2014. Fast forward 10 years later, there are probably 10 big players and there are probably 2,000 companies that are less than 50 mil or 100 mil in rev. Mm -hmm. So the innovation's coming in that space from the, from the bottom up because things are moving so fast. So it's interesting now in looking at that on both aspects of that from a distribution perspective to say, how do we keep doing what we've traditionally done and continue to serve that market, which pays our bills, and then what do we do for the innovators that are coming in that need what distribution can do? And so it'll be interesting talking about that today. Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is spot on. You know, the, the VCs have a mountain of money right now that they're our clients. They have a mountain of money that has been built up over time and they're waiting to invest. Now, each VC, Sequoia was in the news today, not for a great reason, but uh, that, you know, they look at a thousand business cases a month. Menlo, Mayfield, Greylock, thousand business cases. So there's a mountain of new ideas coming and they pick one out of those thousand. Each one picks one. So that's the triage that happens on the front end that, that we in distribution need to be able to feed that one out of a thousand in a different way than we would feed my old company, Cisco, right? They need nurture, they need care. So along that lines, Darren, mm -hmm. we've had uh, several conversations about your needs, maybe multi-country, distribution. What are your pros and cons as you start to weigh in and pick a distributor? 
So our challenge, obviously, like every business, is revenue growth and expansion. So uh, we started the company and we started focusing on Europe during the very, very early days. Um, we like Europe as a marketplace uh, because obviously they see the value of the technology like in the US, but there are small regions where we can actually test a lot of things. And so we actually have signed up a lot of little disties in each country. That works to a point. And then what happens is the growth of th those disties or resellers or larger resellers can't really cope with what you're trying to achieve as a business. So they don't really meet your business goals. Now we want ones that cross multiple countries. And so that's a bit of a challenge, right? You've got multi-languages, you've got a lot of things to deal with. Do I, do I actually just employ lots of managers and partners and build our own channel? Uh, because one of the struggles we have right now is that we're not $100 million in revenue yet, but what we want to do is get a valuable distributor on board that can help us get to that point. Um, and we are going to get to it at some point, but it's again a financial modeling problem, I think, for, for the disties. Um, and it's very expensive because if I have, I've got to make a profit out of this. And so all of the ones we've been speaking to, uh, I spend $1 and I might, might get 50 cents back. That doesn't work for me. That doesn't work when I actually attend a board meeting where we actually say, look, we're not going to make money for a while out of this. And, you know, I understand the upfront investment and we want to do that. So these are the challenges we face. And the United States is even a little bit worse because the dollar value needs to be a little bit higher. Um, but what, what I was uh, talking to a few people about last night was I would love to have a distribution and just do it one time and do it really well and sort of be very loyal to that. And I talked about um, when I very started my very first company back in about 98, one of the, ve it was very difficult because I came from Australia and I actually went to the United States. And do you think it's really easy to get a bank account in the United States when you land? It's nearly impossible. And it was, that was back then. It's even worse now. But the Wells Fargo Bank actually came in and said, you know what, we're gonna take care of you, we'll look after you. And we got a bank account. And you know what, I still use Wells Fargo Bank today. The story being that the loyalty that that instills by actually, you know, I know it's probably not going to be your biggest money maker initially, but the loyalty that you might get from picking those one in a hundred, you know, vendors may pay off longer term. So these are what we're the, the challenges we're struggling with right now. Yeah, and have faith. This, this room will take care of you. Dan, yeah, do you, we, do you we want to react to, to any of the comments that well, you had I, on I, behalf I think of it's spot team? on, and if... Um, I, uh, I was retired for a bit and I did early stage work. And that problem, uh, there's other problems too, which are cash flow, number of sales calls made per day. Yeah. You know, if you just do the math of selling, it's number of sales calls that are made on end users on any given day that creates pipeline, so on and so forth. So in looking at distribution or how you set up a, a sales organization for yourself, you gotta think through things like cash flow, credit, um, routes to end users, all of that. How are you, how are you gonna do that best? Mm -hmm. And being very intentional on where those fit for you at the stage of your company becomes important relative to how you then face off with us. Right. To be able to come in and say, these are my priorities and, and how do you help enable that? Because whether it's Arrow or any of our other uh, uh, distribution partners that are in the room, we all do something to go t have conversations with early stage companies and how we want to do that. Mm -hmm. Some, and you know, particularly if you look now at the at the towers of you know security, data, AI, um, cloud tools, etc. Most of those are earlier stage companies, yeah. and that's where the investment dollars are going. So, you know, we all do something there. Mm -hmm. So it's sitting down from an intentionality perspective and saying these are my priorities relative to. How do you help me on? How do you help me get uh, 20 sales calls per day on end users that are going to go drive this? How do you get cash in my bank account very predictably on time? Right. What do you do for credit for us to help us expand faster than we can? And do so you I bundle them up? Is that how you do it in terms of your role? Is you basically get like 10 of these companies, put them in a, like a little bundle and, and a basket, and basically work them from that angle? Is that how you make a profit out of this? No, we're, I mean, we're going we're gonna to make a profit based on percentage of, we're going to take a VIG, we're going to sure. make a percentage of the, yeah, of sure, the sale. Sure. But, and, and in that, then it's, 
I would say the packaging of it up, if you look at one of the larger suppliers in the room, we probably, each of us from a distribution perspective might have uh, 10, 20, 50 people on a team supporting that particular supplier. Okay. Where uh, across a wide variety, across, we've got to do marketing, we've got to do business plans with you, we've got to have people out training resellers, we've got to be out acquiring new resellers and, and driving that. So that's a large engine to be able to do that, which takes large revenue, yep. which then feeds that beast, right? Sure. From, uh, from our perspective. So to be able to do that on smaller revenue, do we package it up? From the perspective of we would have, um, and we would have the individuals where we have large teams that are doing that across a large supplier, we would have individuals that are doing it across multiple suppliers because we can't afford to have them fully dedicated. So you, it's, sure. it's partial people in roles that are out driving that across those markets. Right. It's like sense? fractional ownership, it's like our virtual CISO platform. Could basically. be, right. The fractional ownership. Right. right. And so, the, I mean, the model for, for you is you can invest in your own headcount. So what's it cost you for an FTE to go drive something? What do you get for scale out of that FTE? Well, it's time and scale, right? right. That's the big, big problem right. we have, right? You want to do it faster, you've already got it set up, right? right? We just have to, you know, right. get in there. That's so now it's that intentionality of what do you want out of a marketing machine? What do you want out of, you know, how do, how do we take that to market together to go drive those right. results? Got it. I think summarizing that discussion, it's, it's, you know, for the vendors in the room, is it, you're not paying a DISTI tax. As a consultant, I hear dis oh, I don't want to pay the DISTI tax. The, it's really an offset of SG&A, right? If you, if you believe that, that your SG&A is, is in a direct model, is the least expensive way to get to Poland, I want to have a conversation with you because yeah. I need to right. see that math. If, even if you want to get to Louisiana on your own. You know, how do you, how do you do that? So it's an SG&A offset for the marketing, the operations, the, the demand gen, the pipeline creation, marketing offset, SG&A offset. Here we have a subscription license-based service, patch management, DevOps. Distribution needs to get prepared for this type of firm. How, how do you service this type of firm? When you think about your needs, your company's needs, going out to the channel to create demand and, and service that demand in a recurring revenue world for something as simple as patch management, what do you need from this room? Yeah, it, it's a good question. So I, I think from a fundamental perspective, understanding the buyer persona of who you're pitching these types of solutions to, specifically with patch management and management, endpoint management, you kind of have two unique teams that don't often talk to each other. You've got an IT organization and a cybersecurity group. One is motivated by risk mitigation and the other one is just, I want to get it done and move on. So understanding that buyer persona, I think is going to be key critical. And as these folks were mentioning, as Ninja One continues to excel in the SMB and moving into mid market, as we think about our paths into new emerging markets, uh, new areas to be able to sell our software. I think that's where we're looking for you folks to be able to lead us by example on how we could potentially bundle our softwares with other types of endpoint solutions. Um, we're not an EDR company. We do have a great integration with CrowdStrike and Sentinel One. Um, we use Bitdefender as well as a third option for those customers that need. We have lots of different levers that we can pull as part of that. But that go-to-market motion and how do we move successfully up into mid-market? How do we support CIOs that have needs beyond just endpoint management? I think is key critical for all of you to understand and focus uh, because as an emerging technology at Ninja One, we're really looking to you all as the distributors of, of choice to be able to help us with that transition as we continue to scale and grow successfully. Um, I think finding, find, and I'll ask Dan for some support on this, but finding that set of your resellers, distributors, that actually can lean in on a DevOps world, on, on a new technology that can lean in and they're not waiting for the next layer two switching refresh, right? Because they're never gonna they're never gonna lean in. That's not their core. You need to find that that new partner that that wants to lean in on new technologies. And, and that's what we help them help them find. Dan, your thoughts on? I think on there's. That. A, I agree with that. I think that also the you know what I'll call the the top of the uh, from a revenue perspective, the top of the reseller stack are 
very cognizant of the fact that, I mean, um, we all know, you know, ex in the U.S., external storage in the data centers had, uh, you know, a tough couple of years relative to growth or negative growth. Well, that creates a hole for that needs to be filled for that set of resellers or distributors that have been out focused on that market. So what are the emerging things right now to go out and have those conversations? What has changed at that end user level is going back in our careers, Cisco had a very direct sales force that went out and made sales calls all day long. They owned the end user relationship. Yeah. They went and drove that. Now WWT has those relationships on Cisco's behalf and goes out and drives and has those conversations with the end users. Mm -hmm. Then they get to do, you, you touched on this a minute ago, they can then bring in plus one technologies that are adjuncts to what they're already doing because they have the relationship with the mm -hmm. CIO. They come yep. and say, hey, I have something that I want to talk to you about that is a, a plus one, an adjunct to something that you know, you're already doing that you should take a look at. And they can bring these evolving technologies in to the CIOs and the CISOs and do it in a different way. They own the relationships now more than the traditional manufacturers did. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, at the time, Paul Bay was, was managing the Cisco relationship. Now he's the CEO of Ingram. And he, he told me that has become more and more relevant. He told me in about 2010-ish that the average uh, bill of materials coming in from a reseller had 3.2 SKUs on it and 2.1 vendors. I was Cisco. I was like, there's something else? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> and so managing that ecosystem, I would bet that those numbers have grown. When you look at an AI solution that needs a wireless solution like CradlePoint, it needs uh, patch management on the software that's installed, it needs security wrapped around it, I would bet the number of vendors in the ecosystem. So for the vendors in the room, pay attention to what, what Dan just said is that that solution provider is managing a very complex ecosystem now. Right. And, and you're a part of it, and an important part, but a part, so play the game. One, one other point on that, Dave, mm -hmm. is if you look at, and again, it's not an arrow thing, this is all of us as the distribution community, and, and I really, you know, I'm looking after North America, so it's a North American view on this, but we are all also moving more to uh, digital distribution, if you will, more of a marketplace type of a concept and having the ability to do this now where we'll have the ability for our resellers and technology partners to be able to reach out to a market in a completely different way because it's going to be digital versus physical. And then the configure price, quote, order, uh, bill, all of that process as a service, being able to do it monthly, doing all of that and tying all that together becomes that is going to be the, the way that all of us as uh, distributors start to evolving, uh, evolve the companies down that path. And we're all like, I mean, it's a, it's a, we all have tennis, that's why I wear tennis shoes. You're running fast. It's a race. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all headed it. that direction. We got just a few minutes left here before everybody runs out to the coffee break. Um, Darren, I'll start with you. When you look out, you know, you're, you mentioned huge percentages of growth that are required. You know, those, those funding guys, VCs and so on, they, they, they like, first, when you're a startup, you have to go get logos. Second, you have to go get revenue. And third, you have to go get profits. Now, both of these emerging techs are probably at the second or third phase of that. So as you look at 2024 and you look at what you need to get done, what can this room help you with? What are your challenges? So it's growth quickly, obviously we've got to manage, most of my day is spent really managing the board, um, you know, probably a few hours a week doing that and just managing the growth. I mean, we've got a great bank account to invest in a lot of things, so where is the biggest bang for the buck? And so this is why we're here to, you know, talk to possible distribution because that's a way to get jump started really quickly. And, um, and, and the other big problem, of course, is, um, is employees, honestly. Um, trying to find the right skilled individuals is taking a lot of time. Uh, we initially tried to do a lot of that ourselves in the early days, and we just gave up on that and said, it's only recruiters from now on because it, it, it's just effective. Yes, it's extremely expensive. And then the other thing is we actually set up all our R&D labs in Belfast in Ireland now. So basically, we're, we're 
gave basically three times less cost. So that's really good value for us. And then our marketing is also over there. And then basically, now we have a little bit more cash available to really invest in growing the market from a sales perspective. So that's why we're here to really talk about how we can do that through distribution channels. Excellent. Mike, same kind of same question. Uh, when you look out at the phenomenal growth you've had and what you need to, to uh, sustain with that new $230 million round, great job. Uh, what do you need? I, I think I'm going to echo a little bit of what Darren just said. So we have 12 million endpoints under management, 14,000 customers. I think the sky is truly the limit for us. We're in multiple geos across the globe. Uh, we do not have the direct sales capacity in order to be able to reach all of the emerging markets. Uh, we don't have folks in every area of Europe, Africa, LATAM, uh, you name it. There are opportunities for our software. Every company, every organization has endpoints because they have people in order to run their organization. Those endpoints are opportunities for Ninja One to be able to sell a innovative but also commoditized software. I think that the value that we could gather out of together in a partnership is really how do we accelerate the growth um, that Ninja's already seeing as we continue to move up mid-market and then start dabbling into traditional enterprise IT. Dan, how do you rea react to all this? First of all, I'm going to hire him as a <laughs> 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 as, a, as an old uh, technology supplier guy. This is fantastic. No, I, I mean, again, it does come down to, to grow fast. You either have to you either have to be so strong from a PLG motion where people are coming to you, right, which is possible, uh, difficult, or you have to have the routes to market to go out and make. Somebody's got to be making sales calls. And so either you're building it yourself or you're creating leverage for yourself by, an, by somebody that's going to come in and enable that with you along that journey with you and go out and drive that together. And, yep. You know, I think that that's where distribution steps in and can really help along with the other benefits. You did an amazing job at for a new guy for a for a new guy and not and <laughs> Michael never had to jump out of his chair. Just I do kinda, right. Just to kind of summarize. Did I address this okay? <laughs> Thank you. Where's Paul? Uh, <laughs> right, right there. <laughs> did I do okay, Paul? <laughs> just to kind of summarize, you know, I, uh, we spend all day every day with the VCs and for the distributors in the room, configure yourself for what these gentlemen need, which is new logos, then revenue, then margins. You have to invest forward. And I know some of you have had practices like Palo Alto. They've probably done okay for you over time, but they didn't start at as big as they are today. So think about investing forward and think about how do you generate that right reseller that has the ability to sell a Ninja One in a DevOps world. Um, Frank, I'll summarize, you know, old guy to old guy, yeah, we're even. Uh, the, the, uh, the, he mentioned um, distribution 2025 a little while ago that we did back in 2018. And, and we, we, you know, if you want to make God giggle, tell him about the future, that's for sure. Um, so I, <laughs> I'm a little leery about 2030. We did get 2025 right, and I'm proud of the distributors in this room because we predicted you would go to what we referred to as digital distribution. You've surpassed that. What I think we're going to predict for all the emerging tax and vendors in the room <coughs> is now it's going to be digitized ecosystem orchestration is where my head is because having the ability to feed the flake Snowflake with Data IQ, Calibra, others that feed the flake and then secure that environment is probably where distribution will go and it will support everyone in the room. So I want to thank you and uh, hopefully I'll see you again next year. Thank you. Thank you.